Okay, so our talk on Peter is uh, going to be two parts. Today we are focusing on Peter that is found in the four Gospels. And next week we'll move on to Peter that is found in the Acts of the Apostles. We know that he is uh, one of the protagonists in the Acts of the Apostles and many things about him can be found there. And one interesting episode is uh, Peter's conflict with St. Paul. Uh, we will talk about that next week. Peter was a fisherman from Bexida. He was named Simon, son of Jonah. The three synoptic gospels, for those who do not know, the meaning of synoptic gospel means uh, that three gospel, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, that shed a lot of contents in common. We call them the synoptic gospels. They recount how Peter's mother-in-law was healed by Jesus at their home in Capernaum. So Jesus went to Peter's house and found his mother-in-law with high fever. He healed her. And the text said immediately she rose and started to serve Jesus and the disciples. Now this passage clearly shows that uh, Peter was married. But then why did his wife not serve, the, being the younger woman in the house, serve the visitors? So some scholars speculate that perhaps uh, Peter's wife uh, had passed away already. Uh, that's why the young lady was not at home. So his mother-in-law instead uh, waited on them as soon as she recovered. Peter has a brother by the name of Andrew. They, together with the sons of Zebedee, James and John, were fishermen. So we have the account of the calling of Peter in uh, Luke chapter 5. When Jesus saw them, they had already uh, just came back from a futile fishing trip the whole night. But Jesus said, you put out into the deep. Somehow they obeyed and they row out and they caught a huge number of fish. I think most of us are familiar with this uh, gospel text. And when Peter witnessed that miraculous catch, he was overwhelmed. He fell on his knees and said to Jesus, Leave me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. He acknowledged his unworthiness. But to his surprise, Jesus said to him, Do not be afraid. From now on, it is man you will catch. You have been capping fish, but now I'm going to entrust you a mission of uh, catching men, meaning to share in my mission of spreading the good news of the kingdom of God. Now, later on, um, three years later, Jesus was crucified, died, but he rose again on the third day. And then he appeared to the apostles again by the seashore. And in the Gospel of John, we have the account of that apparition. And the scenario was almost exactly as this initial call, where Jesus first asked Peter to come follow me. They were fishing, they caught nothing. Jesus asked them to now try it again, and they caught 153 fishes. That was the way Jesus affirmed Peter after his resurrection of the initial calling 
that he had made to Peter. And he renewed that commissioning to Peter to go feed my sheep. Now these expressions, uh, go fishing and feed my sheep, uh, can be uh, interchanged, but can be seen uh, differently also. The expression feed my sheep refers more to the uh, pastoral duty of uh, looking after the believing disciples. Whereas uh, go to the deep to fish, to be fisher of men, that refers to the missionary duty of the apostles. So reaching out to all nations, reaching out to the Gentiles, reaching out to the non-believers and inviting them to come to know Jesus. So fishing and pastoring. In the Gospel of John, we had an, another episode of the call of Peter. Andrew, his brother, and another disciple, they were already followers of John the Baptist. And one day they were with John the Baptist and Jesus passed by. And John the Baptist pointed up to Jesus and said, Look, the Lamb of God. Hearing that, Andrew and the other disciples went after Jesus. They spoke to him. And later on, Andrew went back to look for his brother, Simon, saying to him, We have found the Messiah. And then brought him to Jesus. On that occasion, Jesus looked hard at him and said, You are Simon, son of Jonah. You are to be called Kephas in Aramaic, meaning rock. Now, this referring to Simon Peter as rock occurred on another occasion when uh, Peter made a profession of faith. And the word Peter actually comes from the Greek word Petros, which means rock. Uh, that's why my title, I put Peter the Rock. Peter is always listed first among the 12 apostles in the Gospels and in the book of Acts. The Gospel of Mark mentions uh, the appointment of the 12 and gives the list as Simon, to whom he gave the name Peter, James, the son of Zebedee, John, his brother, then Andrew, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Thomas, James, the son of Alphas. So we have two Jameses. Thaddeus, Simon, the zealot, and Judas Iscariot, the man who was to betray him. So we see this bunch of uh, 12 apostles who were meant to be the close associate of Jesus uh, from very uh, different background. Among the 12, we have a special tree. These trees, we find them uh, mentioned together in a number of instances. Uh, we would say that they were the special ones among the special twelve. And these three were present on a number of occasions when the other apostles were not there, including the transfiguration, including the raising of Jairus' daughter, and then the agony in the Garden of Gethsemane. Peter appeared to us in the Gospel as the spokesperson of the Twelve. Very often when 
there was a dialogue between Jesus and the twelve. He was the first or one of the first to respond to the questioning of Jesus. We find him uh, speaking out at uh, Caesarea Philippi, that place uh, in the northern part uh, of Palestine, uh, bordering Syria. Jesus asked them the question, who do people say I am? And then, who do you say I am? And Peter was the one who spoke up, giving the answer, you are the Messiah. And also at a Transfiguration, uh, when Jesus was transformed with radiance, Peter was so excited and he said, Lord, shall I build three tanks here? One for you, one for Elijah, one for Moses. And then uh, after the resurrection and ascension of our Lord, uh, he was the one who uh, conducted the election of the apostles to replace Judas Iscariot, uh, so the election of Matthias. And later on, uh, his opinion in the debate over converting Gentiles was also very crucial. This part we will mention uh, in part two of our uh, series on Peter. There was a very striking incident in the life of Peter when uh, one day the twelve they were in the boat on the lake of Galilee. It was dark and then uh, they saw Jesus approaching. At first they did not know who he was. It was dark. And then when Jesus identified himself, uh, Peter said, Lord, let me go to you. And the Lord said, come. Peter walked towards the Lord, initially stable, but then suddenly he felt uh, the strong wave and he was frightened. And he began to sing. But at that moment, he cried out, Lord, help me. And Jesus held out his hand and stated him. On that occasion, Jesus made the remark, Oh, you men of little faith, why did you doubt? So we see the character of uh, Peter, the one who is always quite uh, spontaneous, quite fast in speaking, responding, so becoming the spokesperson of the Twelve but also in acting. Very often, he was among the first to take action. So in this occasion, he wanted to walk towards the Lord. But then he was so preoccupied with his, his own inadequacies and the surrounding danger that he feared. He doubted. But then, what was good about Peter that is that he, he always turned back to the Lord, cried out to him, and the Lord would render help to him. Now, besides the reference that we mentioned earlier, when the Lord first met him in the Gospel of John, in uh, Matthew 16, we have this uh, account of the profession of faith or the rock dialogue at the Caesarea Philippi. In response to Jesus' question, who do you say I am? Jesus professed, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Then Jesus said to him, you are Peter and on this rock I will build my church and the gates of the underworld can never hold up against it. Now here we have uh, Jesus telling people that Peter that uh, you are the rock. I will build my church on this rock. And the name Petros precisely means rock. 
So this proclamation that uh, Jesus will build his church on the rock has three levels of meaning. The first level, of course, is Jesus himself. Jesus is the source. Jesus is the foundation. Jesus is the reason why we believe and why there is a church. So in that sense, Jesus is the rock. And then at the second level, you have Peter who make that profession of faith. He is the person who is going to witness for Christ. He is the person who was going to share the faith with many other people. And based on his witness, many would come to believe in Jesus. And in that sense, then Peter is the rock. And Peter being the rock has that essential aspect of faith. And that faith was manifested, was made public by that profession. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. So now anyone who also make that same proclamations, acknowledging that Jesus is Christ, the Son of the living God, sharing the faith of Peter, then would enter into the church and be built based on the foundation of this rock with these uh, three implications of Jesus as the rock, Peter as the rock, and his profession of faith is the rock. Here I just want to make uh, another remark uh, that in this dialogue uh, that Jesus had with Peter, he mentioned actually two things. He mentioned about the church, and if you read on, uh, he also mentioned about the kingdom of heaven. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven and whatever you bind on earth shall be considered bound in heaven. Whatever you lose on earth shall be considered loose in heaven. Now, we must make a distinction between the church and the kingdom of God. Earlier we say that uh, Jesus said that I, I I will build my church uh, uh, on this rock on your profession of faith, and subsequently people who believe in Jesus, who are baptized, who become part of the church, then becomes members of the church. But not everyone would enter the church, not everyone will be baptized for many, many different reasons. After 2,000 years, we know that at this point in time, uh, Christianity is about uh, one quarter of, of the most uh, wanted of the world's population. So there are still great numbers of people who are not members of the church, who are not baptized. But nonetheless, they are not excluded from the kingdom of heaven. Everyone, regardless of their religious affiliation, are all called to enter the kingdom of God. And to enter the kingdom of God means to experience God, experience all that is of God, His love, His mercy, His compassion, His goodness, His justice, His peace, His love, His joy, etc. Everyone is invited to enter the kingdom of God. And church members, we have that responsibility 
and we recognize our role in welcoming and inviting people to enter the kingdom of heaven. Although we realize that some who have entered the kingdom of heaven may not enter the church for various reasons, sometimes it's uh, historical reasons, sometimes for familiar reasons, sometimes for other reasons. Anyway, the keys of the kingdom that uh, Jesus entrusted to Peter can be seen in a narrow sense that uh, if we link it to the earlier uh, remark about Jesus going to build the church on the rock, then it is can be understood as Jesus giving him the authority to govern the church. But uh, if you understand it in a broader sense, then these keys of the kingdom to open and to close, uh, to buy and to unbuy, uh, can mean that uh, it is a ministry that is entrusted to all disciples the ministry of liberation, of healing, of restorations in the kingdom of God here and now. Another important episode uh, in the life of uh, Peter was, uh, of course, the experience of the Last Supper. During the Last Supper, Jesus took the bread, broke it, said the blessings, gave it to them, said, this is my body. He took the cup, said the blessings, poured out and said, take, drink, this is my blood. So that uh, Eucharistic experience during the Last Supper. And then also after the Last Supper, Jesus stood down and uh, washed. He wanted to wash the feet of the disciples. Um, and Peter, Peter protested, no, 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 I, I, I cannot allow you to wash my feet. But then Jesus told Peter, if I do not wash you, you can have nothing in common with me. And then Peter, that impulsive man, replied, Lord, not my feet, but then my hands and my head as well. And of course, Jesus told him, no, that's not necessary. This washing is meant to be a symbolic gesture, a very vivid sign for you so that it can imprint in your heart, in your mind, that I as Lord and Master was you, not only Peter, but the other disciples, that I wash your feet, you too must wash the feet of one another. So sitting Jesus by that uh, gestures was also imparting them a lesson of serving one another. Then after the Last Supper, uh, Jesus took these three beloved disciples, Peter, James and John, to the Garden of Gethsemane. And why there, uh, uh, Jesus asked them to wait here and keep awake for me. Then he went forward to pray. When he came back, he found them asleep and he said to Peter, So you had not the strength to keep awake with me one hour. You should be awake and pray not to be put to the test. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. So we mentioned that uh, after the Last Supper, Jesus took a... Uh, the three beloved disciples uh, to, to pray in the Garden of Gethsemane. Jesus was already sensing that the, his opponents, they were coming after him. They, they would take action against him. So he was sensing that agony, praying. Yet the three disciples, they were kind of uh, so unaware of the agony that Jesus was going through. So they fell asleep, in fact. And Jesus said, yes, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. So, and Jesus mentioned here, uh, you not have the strength to keep awake with me for one hour. 
And because of that remark of Jesus, now uh, in most uh, uh, parishes and churches, we develop this uh, uh, exercise of the Holy Hour. Yeah. In our church, for example, the first Friday we have the Holy Hour. It's a reminder to, to us that yeah, we need to keep watch with the Lord and spending an hour with Him uh, to really share uh, the feeling of Jesus. Then came Judas and that uh, troop of uh, opponents who wanted to address Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. And it was said that one of the companions cut off the ear of the servant of the high priest, those who were surrounding Jesus. And the Gospel of John names Peter as the sword man, he was the one, and Marcus as the victim. Luke adds that Jesus touched the ear of the victim and healed him. And this healing of the uh, servant's ear is the last of Jesus' 37 miracles uh, recorded in the Gospels. So again, we see that impulses Peter uh, wanting to take action and, and defending Jesus in that process of uh, injured um, that servant. And then Jesus was arrested. We remember that uh, prior to that, Jesus actually warned Peter that Peter, uh, before the cop crew, you would have denied me three times. And Peter said, no, 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 no way. I will not go against you. I will not betray you. I will always stand by my, your side. But all four Gospels recount that uh, after Jesus was uh, taken away and brought um, to the authority, Peter followed behind, he entered the court, and there when he was questioned by people about his identity, you are one of them, we, we, we have seen you with him, yeah, listen to you, uh, the essence, uh, you are from Galilee, yes, you, you are the one, three times. Peter denied him, I do not know him. I don't know him. I don't know what you are talking about. Although the descriptions of the deniers was described differently in the three gospel, yet all were very definite that Peter did deny Christ. He denied that he had any association with Jesus. In the Gospel of Luke, there is a record of Christ telling Peter that Simon, Simon, Satan, you must know, has got his wish to sift you all like wheat. But I have prayed for you, Simon, that your faith may not fail. And once you have recovered, you in your turn must strengthen your brothers. Yes, Peter failed, he denied Christ three times, but he had also not forgotten these uh, words of Jesus telling him that Peter, I trust and believe that yeah, when you return, when you recover, you in your turn must strengthen your brothers. And indeed, we read in the Acts of the Apostles how Peter supported the early church as a leader. He had gone through that painful experience of denying Jesus and he also understood the failures and the weaknesses of his brothers and in the early church he was able to stand by their side to support them to encourage them even in those difficult times of persecutions In the Gospel of John, Peter was the first person to enter the anti-tomb, although uh, the women and the beloved disciple 
solid before him. In Luke's account, the women's report of the empty tomb was dismissed by the apostles, and Peter was the only one who went to check for himself, running to the tomb. And after seeing the grave clothes, he went home, apparently without informing the other disciples. So we have uh, uh, accounts of the experience of the resurrection uh, differently uh, described in the Synoptic Gospels. But the more personal and intimate experience of the resurrection of Jesus, we have a, a few accounts, including the one uh, that Jesus appeared and then Thomas was not there. And then later on, eight days later, Jesus appeared again. Thomas was there in the uh, house and close. But uh, most strikingly for Peter, it was this uh, Easter apparition uh, by the Sea of Tiberias, or the Sea of Galilee. And um, three times after they went fishing again, Initially, they caught nothing, and then Jesus asked them to go again. They caught a huge number of fish, and then Jesus had breakfast with them. And during that breakfast time, they had a dialogue, and three times Peter was asked, Do you love me? And three times he said, Yes, Lord, I love you. Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Now, that seems to be an occasion for Peter to have his threefold acknowledgement of Jesus, uh, to counter his threefold denial. And then Jesus reconfirmed Peter's uh, role and position as his disciple, as the one who is going to feed my sheep. Peter uh, describes uh, the church as a building in his uh, writing, First Peter. And this is probably influenced by his experience of Jesus asking him to build the church on the rock. So in First Peter, uh, St. Peter says, He is the, Jesus, he is the living stone rejected by man but chosen by God and precious to him. Set yourself close to him so that you too, the holy priesthood that offers the spiritual sacrifices which Jesus Christ has made acceptable to God may be living stones making a spiritual house. Uh, so this analogy of church as a spiritual house is quite different from St. Paul's uh, description of uh, church as the body of Christ. Paul had a different experience. When we come to Paul, we we'll talk about him. And here, the experience of Peter uh, seems to base his theology of church based on that affirmation that Peter I will build uh, the church on you, the rock. So he used this analogy of a spiritual house. So that is the life of Peter. What are the lessons that we can draw uh, from his experiences? Number one, when God calls, he also justifies. Peter felt unworthy when he was called by the Lord to come follow me and be fisher of men. He said, I'm not worthy. I'm a sinful man. But Jesus assured him, do not be afraid. From now on, it is man you will catch. As uh, St. Teresa of Gagata said, God qualifies those he calls. What is needed from us is the willingness to say yes to God to trust in His grace, and to learn to be faithful to Him. So God is the one who calls. God is the one who invites us to share in His mission. And if God calls, He will also give us the strength, He will give us the wisdom, He will empower us to fulfill our mission. So do not uh, allow any of our own inadequacies, unworthiness, to prevent us from responding to the call of Christ. Now, the second point is that the need to have personal relationship with Jesus. Jesus asked the question, who do people say I am? And then who do you say I am? To that very personal question, Peter responds that you are the Christ, the son of the living God. 
And it is important that we ourselves, each and every one of us also go beyond hearsay and intellectual knowledge of Jesus and develop a personal relationship with him. And each of us is to answer that question, who do you say I am, in our own words, from our hearts. When we have a personal relationship with Jesus, then only we can be committed to him and live a meaningful and fruitful relationship. But if our relationship with Jesus is simply based on hearsay, what other people say, what the priests say, what the nuns say, then we will not be able to commit ourselves to Jesus in a personal manner. Number three, the church's foundation is Christ. In this rock, I shall build my church. Christ is the foundation and the center of the church. And all Christians, all of us, should focus our attention on Him and not allow our human weaknesses and failures of individual members to distract us from following Christ. Occasionally, we hear people saying that, oh, the church is this, the church is like that. The church has scandals and, and so forth. And when we say that, we are putting our attention on human, we are putting our attention on the failures of humans. Whereas our attention should be on Christ. Christ is the foundation of the church. He is the one that we are following. He's the one that we are professing. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. So we should be able to go beyond the scandals, go beyond looking at the weaknesses and failures of uh, other Christians, who are still uh, Christian leaders, including the priests and the pastors, but to be focused on Jesus. And when you are focused on Jesus, then we got it right. And number four, the repented witness. We talk about Peter's denial of Christ three times. That was obviously a very serious fault to deny that I know him, I'm associated with him. I, I don't know what you're talking about. But his fall did not destroy him. That was not the end of Peter. On the contrary, because of his failure, Peter learned from that experience. He, he grew from that brokenness and he could empathize with fellow disciples which he led uh, in the early church. He became a source of encouragement and support for many of them in the early period of the development of the church when they faced so much opposition and persecutions. So do not be afraid that yeah, we might have feel, we might have seen, we might have fall. We acknowledge our human weaknesses, our frailty, our inadequacy, our vulnerability. Do not allow that to discourage us from persevering in following Jesus. We repent, Jesus accepts us, He gives us the strength not only to wipe away our sins, but also to empower us to be stronger so that we can be effective witnesses for Him. Number five, regular renewal needed. We mentioned that uh, during the Easter apparition by the Sea of Tiberias, uh, Peter was given the chance to make the triple profession of love. Yes, Lord, I love you. Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And he took that opportunity to renew his commitment uh, to be fisher of men and to be the shepherd of the flock. That's why for us Christians, uh, uh, every Easter, we have the opportunity for the renewal of our baptismal promises. In baptism, we make that commitment to die to sin and to rise with him, not to follow Christ. Every Easter, we have that opportunity, renewal of baptism and promises. But even other aspects of our vocations, uh, those of you who are married, uh, it's good that annually uh, you, you make that renewal of your 
marriage vows eh, to your spouse. For religious people, eh, that renewal, eh, annual renewal of your uh, vows to your religious uh, consecrations. And for priests, during the uh, prison mass, we would have the opportunity also to renew uh, the priestly promises. And, th and these are very important occasions where we kind of take stock of ourselves and reaffirm our love for Jesus and uh, be supported and encouraged by him you know, to go on uh, in living out our missions. So this is my sharing today.